we're here to protect you and the, and the ones that you love. It's a good feeling to know that our efforts aren't going unnoticed. It actually brought tears to my eyes to know that we have this support. You're welcome. I must just say, you're welcome. It's stressful, but we're not going anywhere. Welcome to another edition of Bucknell Men's Soccer Through the Decades. Tonight we have the decade of the 2000s, and what a group we have in store for you. A great group of alums, along with head coach Brendan Nash and one of our current players, Cody Wax. My name is Todd Newcomb. I want to thank Geisinger, our sponsor for this event. Geisinger has done a great job on the front lines throughout the pandemic, keeping everybody as safe as possible. And we really appreciate all that they do for both the local community and also our Bucknell student athletes. So let me get right into it and introduce the guest that we have tonight on our call. The first is from the class of 2005, Mike Lookingland. Mike was a team captain in 2003 and 2004. He started and played every minute of all 76 games in his career at Bucknell. He was an all Patriot League second team selection in 2002. He was an all Patriot League first team selection in 2003 and 2004. He was also the Patriot League Defensive Player of the Year in both those seasons. He was a USC All-Region first team selection in 2002, 2003, and 2004, and he was taken in the second round of the Major League Soccer Supplemental Draft in 2005. Mike was elected to the Bucknell University Athletics Hall of Fame in 2018. Our next guest from the class of 2006, Adam Edwards. Adam was a team captain in 2005. He was an all Patriot League second team selection and the Patriot League Rookie of the Year in 2002. He was an all Patriot League first team selection in 2003 and 2005. And also in 2005, he was the Patriot League Goalie of the Year. He was a USC all region third team selection in 2003 and a first team selection in 2005. He was also a USC Scholar All-American in 2004. Our next guest from the class of 2010 is Connor O'Brien. Connor was the team captain in 2008 and 2009. He owns the school record for consecutive games with a point at 11, which he did over the 2008 and 2009 seasons. His 31 points during the 2009 season still ranks tied for seventh on the single season list. He ranks second on the career assist chart with 25 10th on the career goals list with 26, and 6th on the career points list with 77. He was an all Patriot League second team selection in 2007, was an all Patriot League first team selection in 2008 and 2009, and in both of those years, he was also the Patriot League Offensive Player of the Year. He was a USC all region second team selection in 2007 and 2008, and a first team selection in 2009, and an, an unbelievable honor he was a USC All-American second team selection in 2009. He won the Bison Club Award at the Senior Awards Dinner, and Connor was inducted into the Bucknell Athletics Hall of Fame in this, actually this year in 2020. Our final guest from the class of 2011 is Ross Liberati. Ross was a team captain in 2010. He was an All-Patriot League first team selection in 2009 and 2010. He was the Patriot League Tournament Most Valuable Player in 2010. He was a USC all region third team selection in 2009 and a first team selection in 2010. He won the Brian Humphreys Award at the Senior Awards Dinner. He was an assistant coach here with Coach Nash for the Bucknell squad for three years, and he's currently coaching at Widener. Again, our current player is Cody Wax, the senior midfielder, and we're happy to have him. And Coach, what a great group. I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, uh, wow, Todd. Like, Seriously, Cody, if you have any idea how great of a group we have here, and when I'm looking at the different faces, it's four different players, four different type of players, and four different personalities that brought great, just great careers for Bucknell and proud for what you guys did for us and, and as we move forward. I also would like to thank Geisinger because it's tough times for all of us, especially you, Cody, because your senior year is currently postponed by Geisinger is on the front lines and they're doing everything possible for us. I had my test today and they are working 24 seven to try and help us get through it. Um, guys, as we're gonna go through this, just to, we're gonna go through a couple different questions. 
But for our audience out there, just update them on what's going on in your life, where you're living, family situation, job situation. And Mike, you're the oldest, so why don't we start with you and give you the respect of being the elder statesman. Thanks, Coach. Uh, yeah, so uh, currently uh, living in Towson, Maryland. Uh, I grew up in Baltimore, so I uh, came back here after uh, the pro career settled down, been, been living here for uh, 12 years, I guess. Uh, I'm married, um, just had our anniversary uh, a few weeks ago, actually. So I've been married for eight years and I have three boys. Uh, Mikey who's nine, Duncan who's seven and Jasper who's 20 months. Um, so definitely uh, a lot going on in the household, especially during all of this um, with the kids not being in school and, and no daycare and stuff like that. So hands are full, but it's a lot of fun. Um, getting to spend a lot of time with the family and, and currently kind of just started back up. I'm a full-time soccer coach at Baltimore Armor, uh, which is based out of uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, we just started training again the last couple of weeks. So we're back to work and, and things are, we're at least training and, and the kids uh, in the youth sports world are at least getting some opportunities to get together and do some things, which is exciting. And, and the kids in the area definitely um, are enjoying it. Um, hopefully it stays that way and we can continue to progress in the right direction with, with what's going on right now. Um, so yeah, I'm coaching and, and living with my family here in, you know, just outside of Baltimore, Maryland. Well, I hope you and your family, I hope your folks and your sisters are doing well at, at, as well. Todd, a little uh, a fun fact for what you said about Mike's resume. You know, like senior day, we, we try to get the seniors off for a curtain call at some point so people can pay respect to them. And we had the game, and Mike did not get a curtain call. And when the game was over, he said, Coach, what, what was that all about? And I said, Mike, are you being serious? And he goes, why didn't, why didn't I come off the field? I said, Mike, you, you played every second of your Bucknell career. There was no way I was taking you off the field. How many people can say they played every single second of their four-year college career? So – um, the Iron Man is Mike Luckingland. Maybe we'll make an award for you, Mike. Oh, thanks, thanks. It, it's Everybody not the loves a curtain call, though, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not the ability to win balls in the air. We will never give you that award. No, <laughs> that was, yeah. Not a- Adam, what are you up to? Um, living in Malvern, Pennsylvania, uh, close to my hometown of Downingtown in the Philadelphia suburbs. Um, you know, with all the COVID pandemic going on, um, I actually have a little bit of the the benefit of still reporting to work every day uh, with my job as a um, production manager for a defense contractor. So I get, I still get a little bit of normalcy in my day to day, but um, you know, after hours I'm back home with the family and we're, we're making the best of everything, keeping everyone safe at home. Um, my wife Tara played at East Carolina university. I have three kids. Shane is five years old. Sloan is three and a half years old and Smith just turned two. So they keep us busy running around playing soccer and baseball in the backyard. Uh, started a garden, you know, just keeping busy, keeping sane here at the house and having a great time with the family amongst all this. Also, uh, you know, hoping for the best for all the Bucknell student athletes that they can uh, move that fall season into the spring. They can get to experience that, um, that final season for those seniors and, of course, the first season for the freshmen. Uh, do, your, do your children have the soccer bug that you and your wife do? They do. Um, even the even the little guy, he'll he'll put a tennis ball out there and kick that tennis ball around the yard without tripping over it. So it's pretty impressive. Um, and the the oldest has played one season. Our daughter was supposed to have her first season this fall. Unfortunately, that's been uh, postponed. But we'll get back out there soon. Connor. Yeah. Um, so after Bucknell, I uh, I moved abroad for eight years playing soccer. Bounced around. Uh, started my career in Denmark. Um, played for six years. I was there for four. Went to Austria for a year. Back to Denmark for two, and then I went to Norway year um, before finally realizing, you know, I'd had enough of uh, a journey over there and kind of wanted to come home. Uh, be stateside. Um, I, I retired. Finished my career about two years ago now. Um, and I got a job in finance in the city as a financial planner. So um, I'm living in New York City, kind of enjoying the uh, 
first time in my life where I've really not been playing soccer. I'm going pretty well. And luckily, uh, the company I'm, I'm working for is doing well, so I haven't lost any job or anything during this COVID time. But I've been able to get down to Charleston, South Carolina, to work remote um, for the last few months with my girlfriend. We just enjoy weekends on a boat and, and have nice weather. So uh, I don't really these days. You'll be back playing again soon in the men's leagues. I know that. Yeah, probably eventually one day. Hey, maybe he can make alumni weekend now. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> uh, Coach Liberati, what are you up to? Uh, so I actually, um, a year yesterday was a full year that I've been the head coach in Widener. So it's been an interesting year. Um, you know, I live in Havertown, Pennsylvania now, actually not too far from Adam. Um, yeah. yeah, not too far. I'm the head coach at Widener, so I, I was the assistant under you, Coach Nash, for uh, three falls and four springs. And a year ago yesterday, uh, I've been at Widener as the head coach and love and living in Philly. You know, back home, a lot of my extended family is in the area, so, so it's kind of a homecoming. Um, big news in the household is – my wife, Kristen, is pregnant. Many of the guys know Kristen because, um, you know, she was at a lot of the games. And we have a little girl due in December. So, a lot oh going on in the Liberati household right now. Um, but, Todd, I appreciate you inviting us. And, Coach Nash, I appreciate having everybody here. And, Connor, it's really good to see you, man. Welcome back to the States. I know, man. I haven't seen you in a while. I know. Well, that, that's awesome news, Ross. And, and please give Kristen my best. And, obviously, your, your mom and dad because they were – Great supporters of the of the soccer program. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, for for our audience, guys, one of the things we've been talking about is just the, the different types of recruiting, and because we've gone through the decades, the guys in the '60s they weren't recruited at all, and then you know things have changed. Like you guys were part of the email and the cell phone recruiting times. Uh, Mike, I still remember your phone call when you committed to me during the the, the snowstorm. And you were making me wait and wait and wait. And I was standing at a pay phone in a snowstorm. And hopefully you can bring that – you can clarify why you're being such a pain to me. Yeah. But if you could take us through your recruiting process and the schools you were looking at and how you ended up deciding Bucknell was the, the right school for you. I'll we'll just go backwards this time. So, Ross, why don't you tell everybody how you ended up at Bucknell? Uh, sorry, Coach. Me or, or, or looking at or Mike? No, we'll start with you, Ross. Uh, well, it was an interesting process. I mean, I, like like everybody, I assume, that's here, you know, we had a lot of options, right? And as you're going through the pr recruiting process, and that's something that I talk to my potential student athletes about now, it's about finding the right fit, right? So academically, uh, sports, socially, those are kind of the big areas. As I was going through the recruiting process, there, you know, there's a lot of bigger schools that I was looking at as well. But, you know, when we talked about fit, Bucknell just checked so many boxes for me. Um, the academics, and it, it didn't hurt that the stadium was going to be open, home stadium was opening up, right as it was coming in as the first year. Um, so, you know, that was something that was really exciting. But one thing that I always come back to, and, and Coach Nash, I, I model a lot of what we do at Widener and, and the, the care that you put into your student athletes is you went out of your way to get to know me. And what I mean by that, Coach, I still remember – when you and Coach Ormsby, Cam Ormsby, came to my house and Cam, who does not like dogs, sat on my couch and was mobbed by my two Jack Russells. And just the fact that, you know, the Bucknell staff took the time to come out and actually get to know me as a human being meant a lot to me in the recruiting process and went a long way to me deciding Bucknell is where I wanted to be. And when I think about my student athletes that I'm recruiting right now, I try to put that same care and, and concern into, all right, let me get to know this person as a human being. And then, you know, soccer will kind of figure itself out. Yeah, it's kind of tough recruiting these days, isn't it, Ross? A lot of phone calls, a lot of Zoom, Coach. Yeah, but you don't get to meet them face-to-face -face and you don't get to bring them on campus and you just <laughs> you don't get to invest in them the way that you should invest in somebody during the recruiting process to see if they're bucked down material. 100%. Connor? Yeah, I guess see, we're all going to have different stories. So mine's definitely different from Ross's where um, I was looking at Bucknell among uh, a lot of other schools just trying to find the right fit. And I remember I was down at Hershey. My sister had like a soccer tournament or something. And 
it was a wet, rainy day. I didn't really want to go see the campus. Um, but my mom, who I have to give credit for, forced me and my dad to go on a trip over to Bucknell and just check out the campus. And it turned out to be um, the move-in day for freshmen uh, at the time. And I just, I fell in love with the campus, the way it looked, and even on a rainy day, and I still enjoyed it. So um, I just, I couldn't get over how much I liked it. And Coach Nash had me come up for a, a recruiting visit. I think, I think they were playing last at, at home that day. And uh, we won one nothing, and it was a game. And I was staying with Anthony Ferraro for the night and just had such a fun night going out with the guys on the team, especially Anthony. Um, I just, when I woke up the next morning, I kind of knew that Bucknell was going to be the place where I wanted to go. And then I sat in my meeting with Coach Nash to discuss the game and just tactics and everything he said and everything I said just meshed really well. And I could tell that we we're going to get along great. So that my official visit to Bucknell kind of is what sealed it for me. And, and I guess it'd be a struggle if, if I had to go back and do it during this COVID time, because I wouldn't have had that opportunity, but um, definitely, definitely the rainy day my mom made me go on and then the overnight visit with Ferraro were both big contributors for me. And Anthony's good people. Adam, how'd you end up at Bucknell? Coach, I think we first had contact via postcards. So I don't think, uh, I don't think we started with email or um, e email or even a phone call. I think, I think I sent in a postcard when I was around 17, probably junior year and um, got something back from you. And it, you know, dialogue started from there. Uh, Bucknell made its way onto the short list. Um, and we, and we were talking a lot. And I think back to Ross's, to Ross's point from my visit to campus to um, phone calls with you, it was obvious that you were taking a personal interest in, um, in, in my decision to go to Bucknell. And I, I remember two things vividly. One night you called me and we, we were talking and I'm, I'm kind of waiting. What's, what's the question? What are you calling for? And there was no particular reason. You were just calling to, to just to catch up, see, see what was on my mind, see how things were going. And um, so you, you struck a chord there. And then on my visit, I remember, a presentation to put together and it, it was I think just the title side I don't remember any of the, the content of the presentation but the title slide was why Bucknell's right for Adam Edwards and it was just it was so personal the, the visit was so personal um, that it really it really struck a chord with me it, it really made me realize this is this needs to be one of my top places to go um, I had my official visit with Matt Arias um, he was an excellent host. It was a Wednesday or Thursday night. I had trouble finding a night when I could come on that official visit, but met a handful of the guys. Uh, they seemed real easy to get along with, really down to earth. Um, and it, it was just a fantastic environment. So, it, um, it, with all that information, I sat down with my, with my high school coach at the time who I was very close with. He actually came to my house when we were talking about a couple of different opportunities. And he said, what are you, what are you waiting for? You know, you got, Division one program, which you wanted. You got a coach who's interested in you, a uh, beautiful campus, and a fantastic engineering school. What, what's your hesitation? And, and the next day I called you and uh, gave my verbal commitment. And it was a pretty enjoyable call because if I remember correctly, you were a high school American, right? <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Well, yeah, it wasn't very social though, so I'm sure you had to work through the call. <laughs> so I appreciate it. Mike? Yeah, we, we all knew Adam was a high school American, by the way. I think he wore that little hoodie he got for playing in the game for, like, the whole fall season. Um, I can but, go upstairs no, and I, get it if you want. <laughs> exactly. <You've heard laughs> <you>. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, mine was a – I got a bison summer camp um, pamphlet – delivered to my high school I don't know how this happened uh, and coach I don't I don't even know how you got my name or information I, I don't know but it got delivered someone gave it to me at my high school at Loyola and I remember getting it and I was like what is this like what is Bucknell I'm like I've never heard of this you know but I also I'm, I'm a Baltimore guy that my parents my parents didn't go to college so I you know we, we just starting the whole process you know everything that came about were like, Oh, okay. This school, that school. Um, so my guidance counselor was Joe Brune, who was about 80 years old at the time and played football at Bucknell back in the day. 
So he, I think, maybe reached out to Buck. Now, I, I don't know how all that transpired, but I remember going to him and he's like, Mike, he's like, I went to Buck. Now I loved it. And you're like one of our, our top soccer players. Like you should, you should consider that. I'm like, all right, well, yeah, let's, let's, let's do it. Um, but then obviously coach Nash came and, and watched me play quite a bit. Um, and we started talking a lot. Um, I went to a really nice private school. My, my grades were pretty good, but, and coach Nash can, can uh, attest to this. I was a little nervous about the academic side of things. Um, I, I consider myself smart, but not, you know, very, very smart. I was a little nervous, um, you know, in terms of the academic standards that, that Bucknell had, but I did have the luxury of going to a really good high school. Um, and coach Nash assured me, he's like, Mike, you'll be, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. You go to a really good school. Like you, your grades are good enough. Like, you know, like why wouldn't you come here? Um, but the thing about coach was like, like some of these other guys mentioned was how, how personable and persistent he was. Cause I think coach is really good at identifying the people that, that he wants in his program. Um, I don't think coach wastes time. Uh, cause I think he's very good at, at, at quickly identifying if a kid is the right fit or not, regardless of grades, but really digging into the, the personality side. Um, so I, I could tell what he was doing and what he was building because this is, was at the beginning of, of kind of his tenure as a coach. Um, and he also brought in a lot of really other good guys uh, with my class. So he used that to his advantage as well because some of us knew each other, or at least knew the teams we were playing on. And, and the class he put together, uh, my class, was, was really, really good. Um, and we all kind of bought into – all right, let's let's see if, if we can start kind of this this process that coach is putting together. Um, and I will say the icing on the cake was was the visit. Um, there were overnights back then, and uh, I had some very very good hosts. And and those that know me, I'm I'm, I'm pretty social. Um, so the kind of social aspect at the school in terms of you could be a Division one athlete, and get an incredible education, but also um, have a have a good time, you know, not not be bogged down like maybe, uh, you know, I'm just saying like a University of Maryland where I, I know you're yes they're competing for a national championship every year and that's our goal as well but but you get to enjoy all facets facets of life um, at Bucknell which was amazing you literally get the the best of everything uh, and yes coach called me while he's in the middle of a snowstorm so um, yeah that was. But that's coach, you know, he, he, he knows who he wants and, and he, he definitely shows you love, but at the same time, he's, al he's always come through. So um, you could see that in, in him and obviously he, he did a great job with myself and all my classmates and we all had a, a really good four years and uh, best choice ever made, no doubt about it, other than my wife, but best choice ever made, second best choice. Yeah, and if you said no that day when I was on that payphone, I think I would have driven straight to Maryland and knocked on your door and might have just punched you right in the, in the jaw and then left. <laughs> uh, Cody, why don't you try and get some wisdom from these guys, okay? Yeah. Um, so what advice would you give me or any other players that are in our program today about the college soccer experience at Bucknell? Uh, I guess we can just go the opposite way. So, Mike, you can start. So advice for, like, incoming players to the, to the program or just how to deal with the college soccer while you're there? Oh, sorry. What? Um, yeah, I think more just, like, for guys that are in the program already, just advice you have. Yeah, I mean, I think I talked to – Coach, you had me talk to the guys a couple of years ago. Um, you know, the advice I would give is – um, I mean, it's, it's the best four years of your life. Um, and you're at, a, you're at an incredible university. Um, you, you don't waste any opportunities on or off the field. Uh, cause the benefit that a, a Bucknell student athlete has, yes, you want to compete and you want to do well and you want to win Patriot League championships and you want to go to NCAAs and, and you want to go as far as you go and win as much as you can. And you should because that's, that's what Bucknell does. Um, 
but at the same time, be intelligent with your off the field choices and make sure you're going to class and make sure you're getting good grades because beyond the field, like all of us right now, one day you're going to be on your own and you're going to be, you're going to have a profession, hopefully of your choice. Um, and if you take care of yourself and you're smart and you make good decisions and you do well in the classroom as well, the, the options for you off the field when you move beyond the game are limitless. And the, the opportunities that a Bucknell student athlete has are far superior than 99% of the kids coming out of any other university in the country. Um, so focus, work hard, and just do the best job you can on and off the field. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Adam? Tony, yeah, I'd have to say just be aware of and take advantage of all the resources that you are surrounded by when you're on campus. You have a coaching staff whose top concern is your development as a player and a person. You have um, athletic facilities that are, are top notch. And I know when Looking Land and I were there, they went from, you know, we went from a grass field in, in the middle of Bucknell West to um, c close to a stadium by the time we left, but you know, weight rooms. We were working out in the old wrestling room, was converted to a weight room for a year, and then we had a brand new varsity weight room. Um, so the facilities are absolutely fantastic. We had swim workouts in the um, in the in the pool. So you just have world, really real, your world class facilities that you're surrounded by um, in, in all aspects. And then also academics. You're surrounded by some of the smartest people in their fields and you have an opportunity to pick their brain and visit them in their office hours and actually have a one on one relationship with them, which is not an opportunity that uh, other student athletes have at some larger schools or schools that have TAs teaching classes. So uh, you know, take advantage of, of all those resources that are around you and, and really use your four years there to develop as, as a person in, in whatever your field of study is or in athletics and really just um, becoming well-rounded as a person as well. Thank you. Connor? Hey, Cody. Um, yeah, I mean, mine, mine's similar to what Mike was saying, where, I mean, Bucknell was probably the four best years of my life, even including, you know, almost a decade in Europe playing professional soccer. I still probably enjoyed my time at Bucknell equally, if not more. So my advice would, would be to really just enjoy it while you're there, make the most of it, meet as many people as you can, make as many friendships there as you can. I mean, the people I, I talk to the most and, and connect with the most are still some of my roommates from Bucknell, like Ross knows Eric first and Alex Mizell, like some of these guys that um, I spend a lot of time with at Bucknell. I still see um, in New York City, Eric came to visit me abroad. Alex came to visit me abroad. So um, definitely develop as many relationships as you can and, and you know, try to interact to a lot of people there because Bucknell is filled with a lot of intelligent and well-rounded people. So um, enjoy it while you can. That's as simple as I can say it. I appreciate that. Uh, coach? Uh, so all three of those guys hit the nail on the head. Well, I'm going to take it a little bit step further and talk to the players that are on the team now because it, it's something that I really picked up as an assistant coach and it's something that, Cody, I try to tell you a lot as well is Coach Nash can be hard sometimes, right? As a player, he demands a lot out of, out of his players and he demand, he, the standards expectations are very high, right? And what we tried to tell guys all the time and what still is consistent through time Coach Nash has been there is you need to start worrying as a player when he stops coaching you. That's when you have to worry as a player. So every time that Coach Nash is getting on you and you're wondering in your head, man, why is he being so mean to me today? Because at the end of the day, it's not cupcakes and rainbows when you're going out to become an adult, right? When you're sitting in an interview room, Coach Nash's job is to make sure that you are ready for anything. And part of that, you know, might be, why is he being hard on me for my fitness? Why is he being hard on me? Because I'm a minute late. Because you need to be ready for that in the real world. So my advice to the guys on the team right now, trust the process. Realize after four years, you're going to be a much better man than you were when you were an 18-year-old boy when you came in. And that everything that Coach Nash is doing is to help you 
as a person. And there was times when I was the assistant coach for Coach Nash where he would be getting on me, and I'm like, why is he being so mean to me today, essentially? And then as a head coach of Wyoming, there's times where I'm like, okay, I understand why Coach Nash was getting on me because I want it that way now too. So trust the process. Um, take the Sixers quote there and just realize that Coach Nash is going to lead you in the right direction. Thanks, Coach. Can I, can I put a question out there, by the way, just real quick? Sure. Speaking of be, being hard on players or whatnot, Coach, have you sent anybody to the showers from the training field, like, in the last couple of years or since I left? Uh, Cody's shaking his head. He might have been a candidate one time. <laughs> Cody. Um, if, if you don't show up mentally and physically, yes, you still get sent. It just And it's not – you come back the next day and we're all we're back to square one. But that day, if you're not there mentally and physically, just go. Just go and figure out what you need to figure out. And tomorrow, you're not in a doghouse anymore tomorrow, but today you can't be here because you we can't have you wasting our time. Yeah, but no, I don't nobody's got sent as many times as you. <laughs> and that was a much longer jog than you had to do back then. <laughs> We were out on field C when Mike got sent to the showers. Um, let's let's go back to, to soccer. And, and um, Mike, me, Mike, I'll start with you just because of what your question there. But um, talk to Cody a little bit about how you matured as a player and if anybody gave you guidance and then how you imparted guidance during your four years. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, I started off with um, – our, my freshman year was pretty rough, to be honest. We, we, I don't want to throw any guys under the bus. There weren't many seniors. Um, and, and this is where I started to realize how important like leadership is within like your group and your team. Um, we had some good um, seniors that were pretty talented. There weren't many though. And it, it was kind of a little fragmented, to be honest. Um, and then year two, we got a little bit closer. Uh, the older guys were like Tommy Ryan and Elliot, guys that like you would die for. Um, so you could see kind of year after year how um, the players that were leading the group and then after us as well, because you see obviously you guys won a lot of championships. I, I never got to win one of those. We came pretty close. But we gradually got better year after year because and I, I think, Coach, was it your second year when I came in or third? Second as the head coach. Second. So it was – we were like Coach's babies. So we, we kind of were kicking off uh, his recruits. Um, so, you know, being together and being like as one is really important. And that's what I realized, especially as freshmen, because you come as a freshman, everything's new to you. There's so much going on. And if you're not getting guidance or the leadership uh, isn't great or the group isn't hanging out all the time and, you know, and enjoying themselves, even as watching a movie the night before games, you know, eating dinners, like making sure you're going to meals together. Um, that didn't happen like my first year. But after that, you know, I guess at that point would be younger guys as we started to move through together, we brought everybody in, you know, so next year's freshman, like, all right, listen, here's how we do things. We're going to, you're going to come over and have dinner with us tonight. We're going to hang out. Like we're going to be together as much as we can, especially during the season. Um, which I think that's for me and even now coaching now and having to know how to man manage, but also, having the right culture and environment, I think that's that's probably one of the most important things that if you're going to be a successful team, everybody needs to buy in and be on the same page. And from the top, the seniors, like they, they need to set the standard. They set the standard and everybody else follows. Obviously coaches at the top, but the coach can only do so much. So from a player's perspective, the older guys, like they need to take the initiative and they need to drive the group in the right direction. And if it's not everybody, 
And if it's a little splintered or fractured, you're not going to have success. You're not going to get along with everybody. Not everybody's best friends is not the point. But if the team is a team and moves together as a unit, then you have a really good possibility of success. That's something I learned just, and, and that carries over to me coaching now. And when you're playing youth soccer, you're playing with your buddies, right? But college is the first time where you go and you're playing with a bunch of different people. So how, how do you all come together to accomplish a common goal? You have to be together, otherwise it's not gonna happen. Um, and we came pretty close, but hopefully we laid the foundation for those you know, six championships or so that coaches won, you know, the 10 years after we left. 15, geez, 15 years. Well, in 2021, that's not official yet, but nobody can take it away from us. So, uh, Adam, your thoughts on how you matured? Adam, you were pretty mature when you came in as a freshman, though, to be honest. So, yeah. So, I'll, so I'll, uh, first, I'll echo Loki Land's comments and say, you know, I think I matured as a – as a team player and, and recognize the importance of that camaraderie and there and there's so many opportunities to take advantage of that and develop the camaraderie um you know eating together in the calf doing things uh re recreational with each other pick up soccer on the off day just for fun you know nothing serious uh pick up soccer in the racquetball courts i don't know if they're still allowed to do that todd but we did it all the time um working out together in the weight room whatever it may be <laughs> Um, but there, there's so many opportunities to develop that camaraderie. So, so that's the first one. I think I, under, I started to understand the importance of that because I had a little bit, I came from a strong high school program. So I had a little bit of that in high school, but it's not the same when you're living in the same hall in the same house or the, or, um, on the same campus as the rest of your team. There's just so many more opportunities. And then second, as an individual, uh, recognizing the need and the importance to continue to put, continue to push, um, yeah, like coach, as you said, I came in, came in freshman year, but then also recognize the guys are bigger, faster and stronger. So, um, you know, putting in the extra time in the weight room, putting in the extra workouts, the goalkeepers always had a few more workouts because we were doing the preseason training sessions with the forwards as well as the goalkeeper training. But, um, so, you know, you, you forced me to learn that as an individual, the extra effort was required. Um, but it, you know, but I had I had to develop that and continue to push towards that to you know to, to secure my position in the latter years and also continue to develop and and be a leader and lead by example as well. So I wasn't always the vocal leader, so it was important for me to lead by example. Connor, yeah, <clears throat> once again to echo off uh, what Mike and Adam said, um, the team chemistry was a big thing for us when I was there at Bucknell. I remember my first uh, two years there, we only had one senior my, my freshman year, and that was Loya. But um, a lot of the juniors were very mature guys, or they acted very mature at least, with uh, Joe Malat, Corey Canute, all those guys where um, <clears throat> listen to them, and the leadership definitely started at the top. But they also were the first ones to invite us over to their house for a Friday night if we had the weekend or, or something. So we, I spent a lot of time with those guys on the pitch, but also off the pitch. So... I made sure when I was a junior and a senior that I did the same thing to the younger guys. And even my senior year, I mean, some of the guys I hung out with the most were Ross and he was a year younger than me and Josh and Brendan were freshmen. And um, I really think the, the reason we had such a, such a solid senior year going 17 and six overall, winning the title, hosting the tournament, that was because our team was, was so unified that year. And, and you couldn't break us apart even if you tried. So we, we did everything together as a team that year. So um, definitely it starts, it starts with the seniors for sure. I, I, I got to go back. Did you, you just really call Joey Kuderbach mature? <laughs> well, I, I said Kernud, but Kuderbach was my roommate for a year. So he, uh, he was a pretty mature guy. He was more mature than I probably was. Okay. I mean, Todd, I don't know if you would agree with that from basketball games, but <laughs> Coach Liberati. When I, I gotta, I gotta point out something Connor said. I think that seventeen six year was the most fun we ever had socially, and was also the most games that we won. So I don't know if that goes hand in hand, um, but Connor, we had some good times, buddy. Um, definitely, definitely goes hand in hand. <laughs> um, I would dis guys, I would disagree. I would disagree. I, I would think it was, maybe, well, I have to disagree as the head coach, but 
I think it was the success that we had at the Mayor's Cup gave you guys so much confidence that we went up there and did something very special like that. And I thought that was a springboard into, wow, we have something special here. But yeah. we'll, we'll use both Plan A and Plan B for that one. That was part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, Coach, to go back to your question, you know, everything that Mike, Adam, and Connor just said, are, are, you know, about culture and everything is spot on. Um, me personally, I, I, Connor, I think you can answer this. I think I play with a lot of emotion as a player, right? And it's especially, yeah, I might set the record for yellow cards in a four-year career. Um, but one thing that I will say that I, I had to work on from freshman or senior year was just managing emotion, right? It can be a double-edged sword. It can be awesome. It can drive you to great heights, but it can also bring you down. Um, and that can be professionally as well. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing that I probably picked up over four years was just that uh, ability to step back and control in the week. I call it a wide and poison amongst chaos, right? Can you show poise amongst the most chaotic moments? Um, and I think that's something that I'll take with me and I'll still work on it. Still working on it. Ross, I think Maya Ali would agree with that as he brought up an emotional outburst you had against him when he made a mistake in the game, right? Coach Nash. I, um, <laughs> He, uh, he censored it, but he did say that you were hard on him for a few minutes after he let a guy take a man line and yeah. you let him oh, out. Yeah, it's, it's the heat of the moment, Coach. It's not cupcakes and rainbows. He had to know. That's why he was an All-American. And listen, he still remembers it to this day. You know, right. he, It was a teaching moment for him. So the, your point got across. I don't know if you always want to use that. <laughs> no, no, it's sparingly. Then that's sometimes the carrot, like. sometimes the stick, right? Exactly, exactly. Guys, we're like we're flying through this, and we're not going to get to all of our questions. And I, I think two of them are are very important that that I would like to hear. And Cody will ask about the favorite teammate, but I would like to hear about your most memorable moment with Bucknell soccer. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a game. It could be. It could have been one of your social things that you did. It could have been a practice. It could have been something that happened in the hotel. But during your four years, what, what, and you can even say a couple things because we still have about a little bit more than 10 minutes left. So, Adam, I'll start with you. What's your, what's your favorite memory from your four years with soccer? Easy, coach. Beating Maryland. Um, <laughs> uh, we scored a minute 32 in and we held on to the to the lead for the rest of the game um it was it was a you know, tuesday night at their place um obviously we were the underdogs but it was one of those i can, I can remember the tension in the locker room and, and we spoke about the camaraderie with the team and, and we just had that strong camaraderie um and, and you, you could just feel the tension was 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 positive though and I, I remember some of the pregame conversations, some of the halftime conversations, the feeling at halftime, but just the, the 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 strong feeling and jubilation when when the final whistle blew. Um, I think their captains had been pulled off the field at that point. I remember their coach threatening to pull their forwards off the field in the second half if Looking Land stepped them off sides one more time. Um, it was. It was just. You know, that was. That was our. That was our spotlight. It was. It was our spotlight for the moment. It was kind of towards the end of the season, and uh, it was just a glorious victory. Do Do you remember the practice the day before? How long we practiced for the day before? Oh my gosh, coach! Let me. I forgot about that. Yeah. It. Um. I. I don't know how long we practiced, but I think there was two inches of snow. Yeah. Twenty three minutes. We practiced. 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. So, yeah, it was a great memory. Yeah, I think I, now you probably just stole Lucky's. So Lucky, yeah, you that, have a different I, one. I, I can add more. I was relieved that, that I, I, I relieved that I got to go first. <laughs> so the the best part about that was, and that that's that was clearly my number one moment, especially being from Maryland. Um, I, I I'm pretty sure out of their starting 11, 10 guys went pro, uh, and they won. The Ian Rodway is the only one that didn't, I believe, and he could have. Um, they were incredible. Um, but I do remember the, the pregame practice the year before. I think we've really tried to prepare for it. And I'm not saying we didn't this time around, but I do remember Coach is snow on the ground. He's like, you know what, guys, we're not going to change anything. We'll just play the way we've been playing. I'm not going to 
I'm, we're, we're not going to sit in. We're not going to add more guys behind the ball. Just go out and play how we've been playing. Because we, we were pretty good that year. Um, actually, very good that year. We went undefeated in, in the Patriot League, but then dropped the ball. Uh, that was the number one moment. And 1B would probably be the three nights after that win on campus. Because um, I'm pretty sure everybody thought we were celebrities for the next three or four days. I do think that hurt us because we ended up losing to St. Francis midweek the next week. <laughs> so that would probably be my worst nightmare because it costs us a bid. But number one, just with a little more spice to it, it's definitely Maryland. And you guys, I don't know if you know the backstory behind it, but uh, Coach Coach Sasha, you know, he's a he's very detail oriented, and, and his daughter actually won some Patriot League championships for our women's soccer program. But after that was over, uh, he was just like, "Please don't share your scouting report. Just please, we brought you down here when we paid you two thousand dollars. Please don't share your scouting report with any other teams, or we'll never bring it down again because." Nobody's had a game plan for you. And I just had a turn. I, could, I couldn't look at him and say, we played, we just practiced for 23 minutes in the snow. <laughs> That's how we prepared for the biggest upset in Bugbell history. So, um, but I, I do think you said, I do think you said, take your time on throw-ins. That was, that was a big one. Yeah, we were shrinking the game. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you win games, one nothing. Connor, and it better not be your own goal against Penn State. <laughs> well, that was, my father would tell you that was probably the worst day of his entire life where uh, we played Penn State at home. And that was during our 17-6 and six season where we were unbelievably good. We were and, better than them that year. And I scored an own goal. And I also missed a sitter with like two minutes left in the game. I just rocketed the ball over the uh, crossbar. Yeah, I, I remember that, Connor. Like, yeah, yeah, so I, I gave them one and took one away from us. Like, it was it – was, but in my defense, it was my 21st birthday the day before. So I was thinking about the party that night. I wasn't focused on the game. Uh, I don't know if that's a good excuse, but that's, that's just my own defense. Um, okay, so how about the positive? What's the positive memory? Yeah, the positive, I mean, I have – so many positive experiences and like you just, even just you making a comment being like let's say you win games one nothing well we won I think seven or eight games one nothing that year where we were really good my senior year but it definitely has to be winning the Patriot League title at home against American uh two days after score where I scored the game winner in overtime against Lafayette and ripped my shirt off and jumped out of the stadium so the entire weekend would kind of be my favorite memory but seeing uh, all the American players and the coaching staff just so upset on our stadium after we won the, the title was just an unbelievable feeling. And, and knowing that we're going back to the NCAA tournament for the second time in my four years, um, that feeling is something that I take with me. Yeah, I took with me even into a pro career and tried to compare a lot of um, victories to that. That holds a, a, a high torch for me. And, and Todd, a little backstory: the semifinal game, it was a uh, golden goal at the time, and it happened to be Board of Trustees weekend. So Connor scores the goal, and I have to turn and go shake the other coach's hand. And I look into the to the suite, and I can see all the trustees that have come to watch the semifinal, and they're all hugging each other and going crazy and whatnot. And I'm like, oh, this is great for Bucknell soccer. And then I turn around, and the team's gone. Like I have no idea where where the whole entire team is. I can't celebrate with anybody because Connor jumped over the fence and everybody followed him and they just took off down the tunnel. And I was like, all right, I guess I'm not celebrating with any of our teammates for this one. Yeah, that was a, that was a planned celebration for oh, the totally season. Oh, he totally so, planned it. He totally planned it. It took a good moment for it to finally, you know, happen. I don't think it's going to be too tough to figure out what Ross's favorite memory is. Yeah, well, I, I will back Connor up. 100% plan that. Set in the locker room before the game. Guys, we score the game and win. I'm running to the locker room. So when that happened, I was, I think, 25 yards behind and trying to catch up. But all-time moment, Connor. Um, so the moment that Coach Nash is bringing up is in uh, the 2010 championship season, um, our championship game against American. Uh, I scored two header goals in the first half. Um, and we won, ended up winning the game 2 nothing. So I will say that is definitely the best moment in my career career individually 
But I think leading up to that is kind of the important part of it is Connor senior year, that, that 17 and 16 was just such a incredible run. And we had so much talent on that team that the next year, you know, it was very easy to have a letdown. And to be honest, in the first half of the season, we weren't very good. And I remember Coach Nash coming out to practice one day and essentially saying to the team, guys, I don't know if you have it this year. And I know we did that on purpose because it made me so angry that Coach Nash thought that we couldn't do it again. So it was really that moment and the culmination of barely getting into the tournament. My Wally hit, hit that shot he hit against um, against uh, Lehigh at Lehigh in, in double overtime to send us through. Or I say it was the first overtime, wasn't it, Coach? Um, to send us through and just getting to that point was something that I'll never forget. I mean, I was definitely not as talented team as Connor senior year, but we had to work really hard to get there, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, and uh, going to the back story again, I remember <clears throat> I don't like watching you guys warm up before games because, like, I'll, I just get crazy. Because I'm like, they're not ready. They're not ready. They're not ready. And <clears throat> I came walking over, and Coach Ellis had just spoken to you, Ross, and he comes over to me and he goes, walk away. And I said, why? And he goes, these guys are so ready for this game. You don't have to say a word to them right now. And I was like, okay, that's great. And then since we're playing American, we know that they're not going to be as prepared as we are. Absolutely. So when the first free kick came, Tommy McCabe, who was very close with Coach Liberati, standing right in front of the bench. And I say, Tommy, do you see what I see? And Tommy goes, Coach, I see Navy. And that's not Ross's specialty. Ross is the guy in the air. And I was like, yes, absolutely. So he plays the Navy ball in, and Coach Liberati scores it. And then 10 minutes later, free kick from the same exact spot. And I go, Tommy, do you see they haven't adjusted? He goes, Coach, we're doing Navy again. I'm like, yes, we're doing Navy again. And Coach Liberati, same exact thing. Near post ball, boom, 2 nothing. Wrap it up because you think somebody's going to beat us 3-2 to two in a championship? Absolutely not. <laughs> it, was, it was a culmination of, you know – it's a lot of like right place, right time, but we had practiced that. We had practiced that so much that, you know, hey, if you see this, be there. And you knew it. Tommy knew it. I knew it. Connor would have known it. Anybody in the Bucknell program that hears Navy knows that we're not talking about the Naval Academy down in Annapolis. So it was, it was a combination of a lot of things. And it's still in our playbook. How people haven't figured it out over the years. <laughs> Um, Cody, I don't know if you want to go with the networking one or the, the favorite teammate one. It's totally up to you. Yeah, I think I go, uh, who was the teammate you admired the most throughout your career and why? Um, you can start with Mike. So, so I have two, sorry. Um, one old, one was older, one was younger. So hopefully that works. Um, uh, I'll start with Tim Fanick who's a year younger than, than me, um, came out of nowhere. I don't even know where he played club soccer. The guy was unreal. Um, played, we played three in the back. Um, he was the left back. He was so good. He made me look really good, um, which he still – Still sends me messages and stuff, even when I got in the Hall of Fame, like, you're welcome, Mike, stuff like that. You know, like, he he knows it. And I tell him all the time, without him, I would have been I would have been pretty good, but he made me very good. He made, he made my life easy. He won goal kicks, punts. I would literally shift him in in front of me so he could win balls and I would have to challenge him. He would – I would put him on – I would move him around the field a little bit to help me, and we would work together – to figure out how to shut down the other team. Um, he's probably one of the most underrated guys coming into the college game that I think he probably easily could have been a pro player. Um, he just didn't have like that in his, you know, I guess mentality to push for that. But he was probably one of the, the best players I ever played with. And since I played next to him, I mean, I, I couldn't love the guy more. He, he did so much, he was so good. The other guy, probably that epitomizes Bucknell as well, is Chris Beekman. Um, really, really good player. Tacking guy. I would literally rope balls over the back line to him 
25 times a game. He would chase balls down. He would beat guys. He'd score goals. He was not – he wasn't pretty, but he would dribble by so many guys. It was like the ball was glued to his feet. Um, but he set the tone for kind of our, our team identity and, and personality and who we were. So that was like one of the older guys that, that I would consider like a special player that also didn't get a lot of recognition. But we wouldn't have been who we were without him kind of doing what he does and leading the way. So those two guys – were, were really, really special to me in terms of what they brought to the team and, and what they were capable of doing without maybe getting the recognition that they, they probably deserved. Well, I was happy, you know, that Tim, you, after you left, Mike, he got defensive player of the year, his senior year. Uh, I don't know if, you know, if you've been updated on Beekman, but um, he's recovering from a torn ACL that obviously he's still playing and still running all over the place. And um, I, I actually, so to play the over 40 team that I play for, they have an open team too. And they needed a player about two years ago. And I said, I got somebody for you. So Beekman went and he was Beekman and did exactly what Beekman. So they were like, can you bring him back? Can you bring him back? Can you bring him back? And now they're like, when is he going to be done with his rehab? We need him back out there because he's, he's still the same player. He never stops running. So. Uh, Adam? So I'm going to place my vote for Tim Fanick as well, but for a slightly different reason. Um, you know, we had a strong back line, as Loki said, we played three in the back. But even from freshman year with Tim Fanick uh, as a left back, I mean, he, he was just a, a silent, consistent beast back there. Uh, winning balls, not getting pushed off the ball by anybody. He was fast. One of the few people who ran the uh, preseason mile in under five minutes, uh, I think almost every year. Pr pr every year we did it, um, which is a feat in itself. But as from a goalkeeper's perspective, it's so important to have consistency with the players in front of you um, to be able to anticipate what they're going to do and get in the right position so that I can, I, can, I can get the cross or I can be in the position for the shot. And he was just always solid and consistent. And then secondly, um, in, in, in those first three years, and Coach mentioned fourth year, he was uh, Defensive Player of the Year for the Patriot League. But those first three years, Looking Land and I got a lot of credit and accolades. And through it all, Fanick still was that rock and was always just a monster on the back line, winning balls and just being a rock star without any credit for it. So, um, and still stay in touch with him today. Still a great guy. Um, and it's, it's always great to catch up with him. Connor? Yeah, so I guess I have two things um, as well. Like he, uh, Ross and I keep harping on it, but my senior year, the team was so close. It would be hard to just choose, like, one guy that I was super close with because, I mean, I can remember countless times where I'd be hanging out with Ross, Eric, Alex Mizell, and Josh and Brendan would be doing everything they could to try to hang out with us. And they were freshmen. So, I mean, we were all so tight knit that year. Um, it, I really, I, I could reach out on that team and still, I would enjoy seeing them today. So um, that was one thing. And then the other thing would be actually coach Nash, because uh, I probably wouldn't have had a professional career without him. Um, when I was done my senior year, he was the one pushing me to continue playing and, you know, how much potential I had to, to keep going and, and really giving me that confidence that I mean I was always a pretty confident player but to the next level and say hey like you can make something with, with this game so um, I, he's somebody that I would talk to regularly for the last 10 years even in Europe when I come back he's always wanted me to come back to the campus and it's a shame I haven't been able to yet but um, I would definitely say he was a big part of my my college career. Uh, for me, it's simple. The best player I played with is on this call, Connor O'Brien. Connor, your ability to come up with big plays and big moments is something that I still talk about with my players. Um, so that's off to you, buddy. You, you know, there's times in the games where I would just win it, give it to Connor. It was a very simple game plan. Um, I got to give a shout out to uh, my roommate in terms of one of the best teammates um, for me is Travis Rand. Travis Graham was always a rock. 
lived with him, awesome guy. Um, was the only one who was able to usually call me down during a game if I did get worked up. Um, so I got to give him a shout out and um, shout out B, Eric Ferson. Connor O'Brien's brought him up a couple of times. Eric might not have played that much, but in terms of a team guy, looking land, he was kind of like our Arius. He's just the man. He's always around. Didn't end up playing the senior year, but in terms of like a culture guy to make everybody laugh and just be around, I still talk to him all the time. Eric first, I got to throw a shout out to him. These answers are actually bringing tears to my eyes because when you're talking about some of the guys and it's just bringing back memory after memory and game after game, and you guys were part of some really special teams and the foundation of what we want to continue to be. And, uh, man, it's really special. Like, bringing up – Nick Taylor might have got thrown out of practice more than you, Mike Lucky Land. You know, Nick might have. Um, but just some guys that weren't even mentioned. Like, there there was some – Will Byrne. How important was Will Byrne to the, to the team? You know, like, he just – he was yeah. a blue guy for us. And we've had so many of those different things. And, and Cody, I hope this is something I'm glad you're doing a, a second one because I, I see that ability in you, Cody. Like they talk about a, a Travis Rand. You have that ability to unite your teammates. And that's going to be important when we actually do get back on the field. So um, I, these guys are trying to put some wisdom on you. And hopefully, I, well, I know you're taking it away. Um, Todd, do you want us to keep going or? It's like the last question, guys, is do you want to give us any advice? Give me any advice on what we could possibly change in the program, um, what you guys learned now that you're over 30 years old and say, Coach, this is something you might want to add into the program. So then anybody can take that one. Well, Coach, I think you can't stop what you've already started. So your relationships with the alumni, uh, your interaction with all of us, um, I think I think the program is where it is today because of who you are and all the hard work you've done. And I know you won't slack off or anything because we still text all the time too and, and talk and, and whatnot. I'm sure you communicate with all these guys, but I just want you to keep plugging away, keep loving what you're doing and, and, and keep staying in touch with us because it, it, it really makes us feel a part of the program still. And I've been removed for 15 years, but I still talk about Bucknell all the time, you know, and that's just because of the interaction and the communication we get from you guys. Um, even not just from the school as well. I mean, I get probably five emails a day from, I don't even know what from Bucknell, but you know, just, just kind of, the, the whole university and the men's soccer program, the, the effort they still put in to, to be a part of our lives and, and also keep us in the loop with things is, is huge. It's massive. And I don't see that with a lot of other schools because I still have a lot of friends that played in other programs that they never really talk about their programs and what they're doing. They don't have golf outings. They don't have alumni this or that or, or whatever. So the interaction and the relationships that, that you guys have with, with the, the alumni is massive. Um, and I hope obviously it continues and I, I know it will. Um, so it's more of a thank you for all your hard work and continuing to, to do what you do for us and allowing us to come up for a weekend and, and hang out and, and uh, still enjoy ourselves like we are in college every once in a while. Um, but you know, e even when you come into town, you're always reaching out, you know, hey, you need tickets and whatnot. So. Just keep doing what you're doing, Coach. You're doing an awesome job. Uh, I appreciate that. And sometimes it's not so easy. And, Adam, you'll appreciate this one. I go to Carmel, Indiana, and one of the players that tortured me more than any, guess who I go out to dinner with every time I go to Carmel, Indiana? Eric Brown. <laughs> well, Eric I, Brown. There, and I understand he, he's attached to his neighbor, Alex Farr, at the hip now. So... But yeah, I ruined them for two years. Good time. Coach, scholarships would help, probably. Scholarships would be good. Well, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, would, it would definitely make me a better coach. I know that. <laughs> it's pretty easy to know. It's pretty easy to figure out who the best player on the field is. But can they afford to get in a buck now? That's a different story. Well, no, you do a good job. Hey, that recruiting class you got this year was—they're really, really good. So I'm. Right. I'm 
I'm looking forward to watching these boys play as, as soon as they can, and I'm hopeful it's sooner rather than later. But you got a special group coming in, and that's another well, and, another and, good and, job on your end. And you can make Cody a little nervous, and you can tell him how good MJ is and how good Sebastian from Miami is and how good Matarusu is. And there, there's some good freshmen that want to come in and get on the field. Yeah, well, I, I, I go ahead. Go. I was going to say, look, and they'll say bring in more Maryland center backs, but you got Matt Owusu coming in, so you've already taken care of that. Well, I would like to have more Tim Fannix, too, by the way, because nobody knew about him. And, <laughs> you know, that, that you know, he was playing at Hughesville High School, and that's how we found out about him just in our backyard in a state playoff game. And, you know, that doesn't happen too often anymore. Uh, Todd, I'll. Bring it back to you, but guys, thank you so much and stay safe out there. Thanks, Coach Nash. And, and I'll start again with Cody. Cody, thanks for joining the call and giving us the time. Best of luck to you this fall. And I know the fall is not going to be the way you want it, but we're keeping our fingers crossed that the spring is going to be a competitive season for you guys on the pitch and that you're going to get out there and play games. So best of luck to you. And for the four guys on the call, the alums, you know, Mike hit the nail on the head talking about this program. And the program is what it is, not only because of the things that Coach Nash does, but because of what you all do as alumni and the way you support the program. There's not another program here that has the alumni support that the Bucknell men's soccer program has. There's not another program here that's as connected as the Bucknell men's soccer program. Now, to Mike's point about scholarships, would we all love to have a bigger budget for soccer and scholarships? Absolutely, yes. But we all know Bucknell is not going to change the way it is. Academics comes first, and that's, that's what happens here, and I will always stay that way. But men's soccer is successful because of the hard work Coach Nash puts in and because of what you all do as alums. And you look at that picture over my shoulder, that, that field is only there because of the support we got from alums and parents of the program. So, Cody, that's a message for you to take back to your teammates that when they get out and they become established that, they can pay it forward and help support the program like it's been done for years by this alumni group. And guys, I really want to thank you for that. And I want to thank Coach Nash for all that he does for the program. And for those of you that watched at home, thanks for tuning in and go Bison.